Hello everybody, this is Dr. Tyler Evans from Arite Chiropractic in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, coming at you live with the research moment today. We are talking about this paper here. Um, it is titled Malformations of the Craniocervical Junction Chiari Type 1 and Syringomyelia Classification, Diagnosis, and Treatment. Uh, this is a great paper that came out in 2009 in the Journal of Musculoskeletal Disorders. And so this takes me back um, to, for me, back in 2010 when I went to the uh, Upper Cervical Conference in San Jose, California. And Dr. Scott Rosa, a uh, mentor of ours, uh, first introduced me and a lot of the people that I know uh, to the work that he was doing and looking at Chiari malformation and CSF flow and how that all relates to upper cervical chiropractic care. So this paper um, really uh, kind of brings it all back full circle after being uh, in a three-year postgraduate diplomate program on this, this uh, area and the, uh, the problems that can arise from it. So today I just want to go through this paper and explain how some of those things work together. Um, so Chiari malformation or Chi, uh, Chiari uh, syndrome was first described uh, back in 1883 by this guy Cleland and then was uh, originally, um, uh, you know, more detailed uh, by the uh, Chiari uh, doctor. Uh, his name was Chiari in 1891. So that's where it got its name in 1891. And then it became... Uh, more used in the 1970s when uh, imaging came about and they were able to uh, diagnose uh, off of imaging. Uh, so Chiari syndrome is the development of malformation of the, basically of the, um, the spinal cord and the brain stem right back here in the base of the skull. And so we call that area the craniocervical junction. So cranium, and then cervical, and junction, where they come together, okay? So all of the contents of the brain sit right up here, and all the messages that come down from the brain go through this hole here called the foramen magnum. Uh, really, uh, really small hole there that transmits all the messages down. And so when there's a problem there where the, uh, where the brain sits lower, that's where we start to have these Chiari syndromes and Chiari malformations. So to kind of get through some of the nuts and bolts of this paper, um, let's see, the, the most extreme form consists of herniation of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum and the brainstem through the foramen magnum. Uh, and when it does that, it compresses them. Uh, the symptoms typically appear during adult, like early adulthood, adolescence, and are not uh, and are are not usually accompanied by um, more severe things like hydrocephalus, but they can be. Um, patients experience things like recurring head pain, headaches, neck pain, um, and spastic, spasticity of lower limbs, uh, and more chronic neurological things like dizziness and vertigo, vision loss, vision problems, hearing, hearing loss, hearing problems, hypersensitivity to pain, and uh, hypersensitivity to touch or, or sensation. Um, so the most common type of Chiari malformation is a type 1, and um, it's probably most noteworthy because of the seriousness of the problem, and uh, because of the prevalence, because it's, it's more prevalent than the other forms. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the, the four types of Chiari malformation. So there's a type zero Chiari malformation where um, basically the, the uh, brainstem sits right up here, right in the base of the skull, but it slips just barely down into this hole. And then you'll have a type 2 or a type 1 where it goes even further. And then it'll have type 3 and type 4, which have all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, more sequelae and, and different problems uh, that can be connected to it, like a syringomyelia. And so we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, so when we look at 
the normal um, when we look at the normal layout of the uh, of the neck here of the craniocervical junction, we like to see that the posterior arch of the atlas, so this this little uh, bone right here, sits just um, uh, below the uh, the what we call the base of the skull here, or the epistheon. So you see that white line. And the tonsils should be above that line. But what happens is that drops below and you'll, you, that's when there's compression. And so that's when the problem begins. Okay, and so we'll just show you a picture of that here. That looks like this. Okay, so it looks something like this. So there's actually, the tonsil drops down into that joint right there. So that's the problem, okay? Now, what that can cause is like I was saying, a syrinx or syringomyelia, which looks something like this here. So there's actually CSF flow. So CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is this fluid that flows out of the brain and down into the spinal cord here. And it can actually get backed up into the cord and create these um, pressure buildups in the spinal cord itself called syrinxes. And I'm not saying sphinx, I'm saying sphinx, uh, sphinxes, not sphinx, okay? Not that guy, but this guy, okay? And so what that does is that actually causes the spinal cord to, uh, to have swelling and have fluid inside of it. Uh, and that causes all kinds of problems, really bad problems. Um, so, back to the paper here. Um, there can be actually four different types of uh, syringoma syringomyelias uh, where they can go even all the way down into the uh, thoracic and lumbar spine. They usually don't go lower than, you know, uh, like middle to lower cervical spine, but sometimes they can go all the way down to the thoracic or lumbar spine. That's when it's a pretty bad case. And oftentimes those uh, cases are connected to scoliosis as well. Um, so just a couple other uh, things that can go along with this. Uh, the defects that you can see um, tend to have fusions of C1 to the occiput as well as scoliosis in 50 to 70% of Chiari type 2s and hydrocephalus, so water on the brain in three to 10% of patients with Chiari type one, but almost all uh, Chiari type twos have hydrocephalus or water on the brain. Uh, and that's because of that fluid buildup because of the, the blockage of that brainstem down into that hole. Um, so the way they diagnose it is with MRI and uh, asymptomatic patients that are um, diagnosed by the imaging, uh, so if they don't have any symptoms but they find it on imaging because they're, you know, they're looking for something else at the time, um, those patients who are diagnosed should not have surgery, but what this paper says is that sh surgery is a good option for those that have uh, symptoms and uh, have a type 1 or greater Chiari malformation. So they do, what they do is called decompression surgery and it looks something like this. So they actually remove the, part, the back of the skull or the posterior arch of C1, pull off some of that bone to decompress that soft tissue of the brainstem and of the cerebellum. And what that does is it takes the pressure off so the fluid can flow again. Now, um, a couple statistics about that surgery. So, and this is, I'm just reading this out of this paper. Um, so post, uh, post-operative relief of pathologies uh, was 83% of patients had post-operative relief. Um, and usually that's in things like headaches, neck pain, um, dizziness, things like that. That's what gets better. However, um, they did say, and you know, I just wanted to throw this in there, uh, but mortality rate, which is due to sequelae of the symptoms or even rest, uh, respiratory arrest, happens in 2% of, the, uh, of the, the people that have the decompression. Um, so, you know, just taking that into account, that's, that's part of what this paper says. Um, and then also with that, 
Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, there was a part in here about, uh, oh yeah, so non-surgical therapies which can be used, well, surgical therapy and then non-surgical therapy uh, would be things like, uh, the first things that they would refer you to uh, would be like um, medication or physical therapy. Um, and those things have some, some results. Uh, however, they said that they were fairly uh, low in, in result uh, outcomes. But they would be things like electrical stim, PT, OT, and then they actually even put a little section in this paper about craniosacral osteopathy. And it was really interesting because they talked about the craniosacral osteopathy and how moving the bone, bones and, and uh, relaxing the muscles actually help restore the, the function of the CSF flow and uh, some of the tissue there. So it was interesting how they threw that in this paper. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, just, just a, a really great paper on the breakdown of the history of, of uh, uh, the Chiari malformation and the syringomyelia that can go with it and uh, some of the other uh, parts and pieces of that, of that problem. Um, and it was interesting how they talked about the osteopathy in there. And, you know, we specialize in the uh, craniocervical junction or the upper cervical spine as upper cervical chiropractors. And, what we do is work to balance that, that upper neck joint. And what we find is that often pressure is released there. So um, symptoms like headaches and neck pain and some of these other chronic neurological problems like dizziness and vertigo and, and uh, uh, visual problems and, and hearing can all be connected. And, and sometimes we see results with that. So just interesting, the, uh, the things that they talked about in this paper and uh, the statistics with, with results. Um, so, you know, if it's something that uh, you or someone you might know is, is going through that, having an upper cervical chiropractor uh, look at that joint and, and see how it's aligned and how it's balanced might be a good non-surgical option. So, uh, again, thanks for listening. And uh, this is Dr. Tyler Evans from Arite Chiropractic. Have a good day, and we'll see you next week.